opportunity to speak on uh, before you. Uh, I have been asked to speak on a topic uh, which is uh, on which I am not an expert. Uh, I have uh, certainly studied uh, the theology of Hinduism. I have uh, read through Bhagavad Gita many times. And uh, generally on stress management, I've always believed uh, that you give, st you give stress to others but don't get stressed to yourself. <laughs> it's been my philosophy, but uh, to speak to you, I, I'm, I'm basically a trained economist. And uh, I have a PhD in economics, I've been a professor. Uh, first 10 years I was at Harvard, then I went back to India. Then I got in trouble with Mrs. Gandhi and uh, she threw me out of IIT. Uh, so I couldn't get any other job in India. So instead of migrating, I entered politics. That's how I became a politician. <laughs> of course, the job came back to me because the courts reinstated me after 22 years. And I got all my back salary without ever doing any work. <laughs> so, but I did, could not go back. By then, I had become a minister and things like that. <clears throat> so that's how I came to politics. Many of my political uh, opponents uh, hired lawyers to file cases against me, mostly defamation cases. And I didn't want to waste money uh, hiring lawyers. So I decided to learn law. And uh, although I didn't take a degree, I learned law. And for all my cases, I've had maybe 46 defamation cases against me, and I've won all of them. So now. <laughs> In fact, I'm not including uh, once Mrs. Miss uh, Jailalita had filed 100 cases against me, hoping that I'll be just spending my life going from one court to another. And I went to the Supreme Court against it and got all 100 cases uh, dismissed in one uh, one order. So I uh, became an expert on defamation law, and then soon. Uh, uh, I got into other things. So people think I'm a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, at least not an uh, enrolled lawyer in that sense. I studied law, but I did not uh, uh, enroll myself as a lawyer. So that's how I came to law. It's uh, the periva that is uh, Jendra Saswati arrest, which made me began thinking about uh, Hinduism and uh, why he was arrested, what was the background behind it, and when I started going, I thought now Hindus were under siege, and it was invisible. So that's how I got into this whole field of Hinduism. And slowly I started writing about it, and people, to meet the, the objections of people, uh, particularly youngsters that, you know, now in this day and age of globalization, how can we talk about all these religious values and so on? And then I suddenly came across, I propounded a theory as to why Hindu values are essential for stabilization of globalization. And the tribute for me on this work came from Fordham University, which is a, a Christian, a Jesuit a Christian university. And the president presided over my lecture. I came specially on a one day trip from India on 2nd June to address the uh, a select gathering uh, on Hindutva principles of economic development. And the reason I was invited is because the president said, and the head of the Department of Economics, who was also was an Indian and known to me for a long time, called uh, Rishikesh Vinod, uh, they, they felt that uh, there is a dissatisfaction that exists in society and people are looking for new ways to uh, achieve material progress without uh, the attendant misery that comes with it. And people become very rich and still become unhappy. The case of Julia Roberts is there uh, who went for a shooting to Haryana and uh, there she saw people with uh, great serenity in their faces. So she asked somebody in the, in, the, in the set, how come these people with so much poverty are they so serene? So he, that person in the set took uh, her to a guru 
in Haryana. And he explained to her Bhagavad Gita and why people in India have sort of internalized it without realizing it. And that's what makes us uh, much more uh, uh, peaceful than, uh, or at least at peace than uh, other societies. And she came back and she converted with her entire family. She became a Hindu. Now if uh, such is the power of Hindu, Hindu thinking in a place like Haryana, you can imagine uh, if you had gone to uh, Varanasi, what would have happened? And that happened to Stephen Jobs, who produces the iPhone, the well-kept secret. Uh, he came to Varanasi and became a Hindu. And there are many such. And now there's a plethora of books which have come out. <coughs> One is called American Veda by Philip Goldberg, uh, which uh, describes how Americans are getting increasingly fascinated by Hindu, Hindu concepts and Hindu thoughts. Then, of course, you had the famous article of the editor of, one of the editors of Newsweek, Lisa Miller, I don't know how many of you saw that. Now we are all Hindus, you know, that was the title of the article. Uh, these are reproduced in my, one of my more recent books, not the latest book, uh, but my, one of my most recent books called uh, Hindu Tour for National Renaissance, uh, which has uh, been a bestseller in India. And uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, if you get that, uh, Guru Varipan knows how to you will be able to uh, see uh, all these things reproduced, what's coming in America. There is an undercurrent here uh, that somehow materialism alone will not produce happiness. Uh, that you need some value system which has to be managed with that. Even the Chinese are now begun to talk about that. In fact, uh, the Chinese president has propounded that the, American, the Chinese society will in future be a harmonious society and not a socialist society. Of course, it's not a socialist except in name, but uh, the fact is that he propounded that. And he said the reason is that when people become, some people become rich, others don't, jealousy comes in and then this uh, recreates uh, class antagonisms and so on. So to overcome these emotions, you need values. And he said Buddhism and Confucianism are values which will tell you how to strive without being jealous. And that's why he's, uh, now he's held conferences, um, the first uh, after what, after almost 60, 70 years of communist rule, uh, Buddhist, international Buddhist conference was held in, in Beijing. So uh, there seems to be some consensus going around the world. And it's in that context that I started studying religion. So I'm here, uh, just to, exp as a, to explain to you how in my personal, uh, what I've learned in my personal experiences and how I apply them and how I borrow them, uh, how I trace them to the Hindu thought and thereby bring in stress management. So this is what I am, I'm not speaking to you, my, my name may be Swami, but I'm not a real Swami. <laughs> uh, South Indians have this Krishna Swami, Narayan Swami, etc. My father thought, why should we all have these long names, let's have just Swami. And I used to be known as S. Swami in school, but the Americans, you see, they, when I came here as a student, they said, what is this S? So I told them, so they, they, they listed me as Subramanian Swami, so I became Subramanian Swami as if, my parents have named me Superman and so on. Uh, so, it's in this background that I have now thought that we have to translate these esoteric concepts of our tradition to a simple, understandable way for the modern generation. And uh, it is in this context that uh, I've taken a leap into the future of helping a friend to set up a new television station in Tamil Nadu uh, called Krishna TV. And I'm pleased that I'm addressing uh, a, a, my first meeting in the United States the district uh, with, uh, uh, on a, from Krishna temple. I'm here because uh, Harvard every year invites me to teach one semester, which is a compressed semester of the summer. 50% of the students are Harvard students and 50% come from outside. So uh, uh, I'm using that advantage of being anchored at Harvard to travel 
Ja to ten pasik raczej 